What's happening, savages? It's Tuesday, the 19th of September. This episode of the check-in is brought to you by Liquid IV. Get your hydra- hydration in check. Just mix one stick of Liquid IV with some water and get hydrated two times faster than with water alone. Available in awesome, awesome flavors, cherry, concord, grape. My new favorite is the white peach sugar-free. Made with quality ingredients and three times the electrolytes of your leading sports drinks, adding liquid IV to your routine is going to be a no-brainer now. Listen, real people, real flavor, real hydrating. I've been with these guys drinking that product for close to four years now. I love the strawberry, the dark cherry. They got a new cherry, but this new white peach sugar-free, forget about it. And if you drink cocktails, that's even better. Put some rum in this thing here. You'll be floating and stuff. But anyway, grab your liquid IV in bulk at Nationwide at Costco. But I'm going to get you 20% off when you go to liquidiv.com. Did you hear what I just said? 20% off when you go to liquidiv.com. Use code Joey at checkout. That's 20% off anything when you shop for better hydration using promo code Joey at liquidiv.com. Take a chance, Columbus did. It's tremendous. The check-in is also brought to you by Manscaped. Listen, if you're going for the clean-shaven look but hate the mess and hassle of a wet shave, listen up, guys. The handyman, Manscaped's new electric face shaver, lets you shave up to three days of growth. No water or shaving cream required. Who's better than Manscaped? Nobody. They got the same solution for your balls and your asshole. You put that fucking manscape on your nutsack and your tip top magoo with both a long hair leveler and full shaver blades. No matter what you look want to look like, the handyman is here to help you. And if you're short on time, the five-minute quick change feature is a lifesaver with the rechargeable battery that offers 60 minutes. That's right. 60 minutes of runtime with Manscaped skin safe technology to help reduce nicks and cuts. You'll feel more confident whether you shave your face, your butthole, your ears, or your nutsack. Listen, I'm an old man. I still do my fucking Manscaped up. In fact, I got the extra blade because those white hairs are tough to cut. They're like Paul Bunyan's mother's tree. You know what I'm saying? So if you're a guy in the go, never leave the handyman at home. Perfect for travel. It's compact and airplane friendly. You ready for this? They're going nuts over that Manscaped. They're going to give you 20% off. That's right, 20% off. It's the Rosh Hashanah special. Free shipping with code Joey. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Use code Joey. Let's get this party started, gentlemen. Turn off your TVs. Run for your lives. It's over. They didn't put you on this planet just to give up. If Uncle Joey could do it, I could fucking rule the world. That's what you gotta be thinking. Welcome back to show! Pick that phone up, bitches. It's What's Monday, up, cop sucker. What's happening? Tuesday. Who are you kidding? Tuesday the 19th. I'm officially 60 and fucking uh, seven months now. So I'm past the 60 and a half. I didn't know you counted half birthdays now. What are you going to do? Things are bad all over. How's your week going? <laughs> My week's going great. I had a lot of fun this weekend in Saratoga. That was a blast. Thank you to everyone who came out and said hi. I had a great week. And then I, I just... It's fun. I love. I was driving back and I was just listening to my bets lose, which is fun the entire way back. And it was just the Green Bay Packers. They just fucking broke my heart yesterday. You know why are you messing with those people? They're still in the state of confusion up there. Pop is gone. They don't know what's going on. The what other fuck. Jordan... Let's start back to last Monday night. What oh God, fuck? I feel so bad for them. I felt bad for them, but I got to be honest with you guys. I I don't know. I'm a fucking old idiot. (laughs) Corporations have risk assessment people. You know, I think that 
people have risk. I'm just a fucking, you know, I don't know nothing about football. I don't know the games. But I know the money they were paying them and uh, what they were expecting from them. Like, I, I live here in New Jersey. And I go to the gym in the mornings. And they always have, when I ride the bike, they have, like, Sports Center on. And every morning, it's it was like, are they going to win the Super Bowl? You know, it was like, guys, the guy's 39. He's got a great defense. He's got a great offense. He's got not, not a good offensive line. And he's a different fucking Aaron Rodgers. He wears a ponytail now. <laughs> you know, he, he doesn't eat cheese. He, he's a vegan. That's a different world. That's like, you know, me with stand-up. Like, if you hire me now for a headlining gig, you'll know what you're going to get. Oh, I'm sure. going to go up there and, and improvise. That's why I don't take the gigs. He took the gig. He took the challenge. And he goes down four plays into it. The Jets, first of all, did a fucking kiss at that. <laughs> I was a Jet fan last night, my man Steve. I said, they got this. You know how the Scientologists give those fucking IQ tests? Yeah. They got to go to a jet game with those fucking people and take IQ tests and go, why do you keep coming here? You're in no danger. You dress up with the fucking silver chain on like a Momo with the green shirt on. I mean, they make more on the shirts than what they do from selling tickets. And people gotta... black in every goddamn. I don't understand. And I was telling my friends, like, I grew up here in the fucking 70s. And the expectations of your teams were so much bigger. Like, you know, it's even Belichick in the 70s. Well, the, the the New England Patriots didn't have that dynasty like, you know, fucking uh, the Jets had like in the late 60s. They won in 69, you know. But all these teams now, we just accept. We, we go to this fucking stadium. We pay three bills a ticket. And we got to go home and, like, you know, you got to go back on the train with that jersey. They just got killed. Can you imagine the Giant fans last Sunday night had to get back on that train with that Giant shirt 40 or nothing? I light that thing on fire when I got home. <laughs> I tried to go home shirtless. You know Here, what I'm saying? Before we forget. What happened? Oh, yeah. Hamas Sata. Happy Rosh Hashanah to all Thank the Jews who struggle. I've been saying this so since day one. Don't sleep on the Jews. They're making a strong comeback. But in oh reality, they never left. Ga, 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 ga. Bam. He, I saw a clip today Ian, of Ian, an Ian Edwards joke where he's saying he likes Jews because they named their holidays after black women. And it, oh, fuck. He said there's like, he knows five Rosh Hashanahs. It killed me. But listen, I hate every New York sports team, and maybe except the Mets. But I respect Jets fans. Like they've been shitty. I, I respect them too because they keep showing up. Even yeah. Though nothing good's going to happen. They keep showing up, but now we're living in a fucking New York City area where all four teams are fucking god awful. I mean, the Giants played a great game yesterday against Arizona. You but know, they're supposed to kill Arizona, huh? Arizona, Arizona is trying to lose. They got two. They they fired their backup quarterback, and they they hired two backups. They signed two backups who had never played it, and they're doing great. Do you see that? There was that one where the Arizona quarterback ran it in and like this, like the guy looks like he has like a health condition, like he has no hair. He and he right, just right, 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 pulled right. over the guy. Like <clears throat> he just killed him. But they, they ended up coming back. The Giants came back, but never have I I was hearing, I don't know. I was hearing uh, you know, the eighties. And the Giants, I think, ended up winning in eighty seven or something. They beat Denver or somebody, or I forget the Bills <clears throat> and uh, and uh, or New England. I have no idea, you know. But I know that eighty six was when the Mets won, mm -hmm. you know. So you have four teams, all of them. Like okay, I, I don't expect all of them to be fucking championship teams, but there was something. It was always a ray of hope in New York, New Jersey area, you know. And now you got four fucking bombs. The Yankees are what they are. If Judge hits a home run, they win. If he don't, we go home with nothing. We're fucking lint in our pocket. You know, the Mets are fucking atrocious. I try watching them. You know, I'm an honorary Met fan from my mother. But it's so crazy with sports, what we accept now. You look at these teams, and if they don't have a fucking quarterback, I mean, we just, we're just dead. 
You, you just have no fucking team. You're just playing out there. And, and the quarterback is the biggest shortage in the NFL. But who gives a fuck about the NFL, my friend? Aaron Rodgers got $70 million. I got $2 in my pocket. <laughs> At least I got my tendons. Knock on wood. How was your weekend, beautiful? Everything was great. I uh, I was really, I was actually kind of proud of myself. So I'm so new at this stand up thing, but I like when I first came back last April, if I was doing a show at like a club, I would pay, like I, I hate walking, but I would pace. I would be so nervous about remembering, like I'd just go over in my <clears> head, <throat> like from like each joke I wanted to hit in what order. And then I, I got a little bit less nervous about that. But if someone like yelled something out, even if I had a joke about it, I wouldn't follow it. I would just kind of like steamroll it. And it, I would always be disappointed because I felt like it could have been something like cool and seem a little bit more off the cuff and seem a little bit more like in the moment. And it happened on the late show Saturday. I have, I don't know if you can relate to this. If you, if you ask me to do 15 minutes, I have a pretty solid 15 now, and I have 20 and 25, but it's usually the same order. And Late Show Saturday was the first time that I, like, followed where the audience, like, wanted to go, I guess. Like, what I be? And it was, it, like, it went great. It was, like, one of the coolest, it was, like, one of the most fun I've had on stage. And it was a, a small show, but it was, I don't know, I was just really happy that I went with it. And followed where it was trying to take me. Very interesting. When you called me Saturday night, I was watching the Colorado, Colorado State game. When you called me, and when you told me that, it made me very excited. Because that's a big thing that a lot of comics don't know what to do. Do you address it, or do you not address it? If you're in a room, work in a room, and a waitress comes in, and she's having a rough night, and somebody bangs into her, and she drops three glasses, and the whole audience notices, you have to react to that in some way or form. I don't want you to go for it if it's a fucking, if there's nothing really there. Mm -hmm. You know, don't put the waitress down. Don't oh, yeah. Just, there's so many fucking different things. Don't put the waitress down. You know, if, I, I believe in one thing. Sometimes somebody says something that's so fucking stupid that if you join in, it's going to ruin the fucking show. But sometimes somebody gives you something and it's a, a what, do you, what do people call it? A hanging vine? A hanging that, I've vine. never heard that, but that makes sense. It's just something that's there. It's like when you're, when you're going for a triangle in jujitsu and he kind of, and all of a sudden you switch it to an arm bar. You saw something. There was a hanging limb somewhere you know and that's comedy there's always a hanging limb i always played it off if i could take it somewhere i address it sometimes they just throw something right on your fucking lap <clears throat> and if you don't address it you feel bad like you have been but if you address it and they got somewhere to go with it there's an old tape of mine that i was at the flappers with you one night uh-huh got on stage and within the two fucking minutes I got on say some lady goes, talk about the Jews. <laughs> you remember that? Okay, in my world, let's just use that for an example. If I go, uh, shut up, lady. I don't talk about the Jews. You know, they've suffered through, you know, that's the typical Hollywood comic that would say it. Let's talk about the Jews. Let's talk about the fucking Jews. Obviously, she said that because she's Jewish. I had to look real close because I can't see him. <laughs> you know, Rosh Hashanah says it to me and fucking she's black. So I I played with the Jew joke and it won. It it, it, it was good that night. Now, some nights is going to be bad and some nights is going to be good. And some nights, Lee, you're going to have a 45 minute spot. And at the third minute of your show, somebody's going to say something. And you're going to run with it all the way to the end of the show. You're going to get off the stage going, I can't believe I didn't say a joke. See, that gives me anxiety. I, have I haven't done that. I haven't ad like, I have ad-libbed for maybe three minutes. Like, I, 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 get, I, I don't feel like I'm funny enough yet to just go off off the cuff and not do material. When did you start doing that? 
like not doing material? <clears throat> when I first started comedy, I was very anal like you. And I would not go up there without a prepared set. And sometimes I would just do like, let's say I had three minutes. I'd put like three jokes, equate them to be one minute a piece, but they'd be 10 seconds a piece. Right. And yeah. There with two fucking minutes of dead air. And I started reaching. That's what I call it, reaching, you know. And then I got comfortable with comedy, but I came to New York and I made one of the biggest mistakes that a lot of New York comics make is they speak to the audience. They call it ball busting. And for a while, I got involved in that. When you ball bust, you're telling me you don't have material. So when I come right up on stage and I'm like, how you doing? I'm Lee Syatt. What do you do for a living? You know? And yes, it's entertaining for a while. But eventually, a club owner is going to go, hey, do you have any material? You, gotta, you can't keep improvising in my club. Really? And some guys okay. get really good at it. Some guys get really good at it, and I appreciate that. But again, it's like going to Vegas and throwing a 50-50 dice. I don't know where my set's going to go. And that's great when you're an MC and a feature act. But when you're a headline, unless you're really good at it, you know, they're paying 25 35 45 bucks to see you. They, you know, that's great that you could talk to the audience for 20 minutes, but they're there to hear about you. And your right. world. Now, your world is different from their fucking world. Do you do you ever use it as a way to to like mine new material? Like if you weren't headlining, like if you were doing a set at like the ice house or the store, but you never <clears> really I don't I don't even really remember you doing it that much. You would ad lib yourself, but I don't really remember you talking to the crowd that much. No, because it took me a long it's like playing basketball. And getting a rebound and dribbling and going right back up. That's the worst thing you could do in basketball as a forward is bring the ball to the ground and dribble it. And once you start to doing it, it's a hard fucking habit to break. And once you start talking to the audience, it's a very hard habit to break. It's a habit that I started in 92 and a half when I started at the broker as a house MC. And then I came to New York in 93 and I fueled it with the clubs in New York. I saw it working and I would try to do it. And then when I moved back to Colorado, tail end of 93, again, I was back into there. And then something happened in 94 that I, I got to start writing material. And I did. But when I got to Seattle, I started doing it again. Thank God Seattle was a little bit more structured of the city for me and the Club managers spoke to you after you set. With my situation, was a gentleman named Carl Womanhoven. I just spoke to him on Facebook the other day. He was the club manager on Mondays. And he would always talk to you a little bit. And he said to me, you don't want to take that habit down to L.A. And what about what was it about him that, like, you took his advice? Because I would imagine there'd be some club managers who'd be like, fuck you. <laughs> <clears throat> he was very knowledgeable about stand-up and just the way he spoke to you. It was never disrespectful in any way or sense. And, and then I gained respect from him, and I would talk to him after all my sets. <clears throat> yeah, I would talk to him after all my sets. Just why not? On a Monday and Tuesday, why not? What Are there any other, because I have one, like bad habits that you got into as a stand-up on stage? Speaking to the audience, going on stage with a bottle of alcohol. Really? As, okay. As a young comic, you're trying to be cool. You're trying to, those guys that go up on stage with the drink, with the fucking straw, and they suck on it, or they jiggle the ice cube. It's been done already. Be original, you know? Be original. You're going to go up there with the drink to get calm. Who's got their drink on? First time I go see a calm, <laughs> who's got their drink on? I abandon the fucking ship. What's it got to do? What joke is there about my drink on? Right. You know. I, you, I, would, I, was, I, I, I had like a, a terrible, and I told you about it, like three to six months, I was jumping off early. Like sometimes... Like right as the light hit, 
I don't know what it was. And I didn't want to. And I tried to fight it. But I was so nervous about running the light that I just, like, for, like, months couldn't help but get off, like, two, three minutes early. And thankfully it stopped, but... When I first became a comic for the first five or six years, I was speaking in English, but I was talking in Spanish. What does that mean? That was I was talking in English, but I was using my Cuban speed talking techniques (laughs) to get through the jokes because I was very petrified. We all do that. If you told me I had five minutes, I swear to God, I would do two. And I'm like, I'm good with that. (laughs) No, you're not good with that. You got to go up there and do your material. You give me 15 minutes, I show up and do eight and go, I'm good. For a long time, that was my bad habit. I'm good. No, bitch. Go up there and you owe me seven fucking minutes. That was a hurdle. Learning how to slow it down, get the confidence to slow it down, assert yourself. And it's something with your body language where you're holding your ground, but you're not in a fight. It's the Florida rule. Hold your ground, whatever, and some guy with dirty feet hits you in the head with a fucking bottle. <laughs> but no, the whole thing is fucking once it and it takes years, guys. To hold your your ground technique is just my confidence. You're not getting around me. You know what I'm saying? Like you're not getting around me. That's what you're thinking about, but that body language lets them know that you're running things. You know, a person gets heckled because he gave three or four people the idea that he was self-conscious or insecure. What gives you that idea? So that's when the heckling starts. Everybody gets heckled. I got heckled, except I didn't, a lot of times I let them throw the heckle up and you don't assert, you don't. You know, you know it's a stupid heckle. And if you do heckle back, you're going to get into an argument, and that's not what your crowd came to see. You winning an argument on stage is not what your crowd came to see. Yeah, so that's... what's that? I, I, It's one of my least favorite things as, like, a stand-up fan is when I go and, like, the comic is right away, like, talking shit on the audience. Like, they well, yell that's... at them. That's a young comic. That's a young comic that thinks that, like myself, audiences are different. I used to pre-qualify audiences. Like, you know, look at these guys are old. They're not going to get that joke. You know, no. All audiences are the same. You're the one that fucked up this episode. You're the one that fucked up this set. You know, and it's like anything else. you got 10 sets. You're going to bomb all 10 of them the first couple of weeks. Then after that, you pick up momentum. You do well two of the 10 sets and then three of the 10 sets. Then you bomb for 25 sets and then you destroy for six sets. The whole goal is of getting on stage so much that you flip the percentages on them. And now I'm not going on. Now I'm trying to hold my fuck. I would love to bomb before I got off comedy. Hold on. There you go. <laughs> I will talk the colostrum is working, Jack. Ooh. What so, the fuck is colostrum? It's breast milk. Oh, okay. Yeah. You drink breast milk now? Yeah, I got a little chick in the garage. I hang her upside down. <laughs> and <suck> her <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> I fucking got a... It's a powder you order. And you mix okay. it in, in with the liquid IV. Ooh, I'm sweating. Oh, I'm, you know, I, I don't miss those farts. No, it's a good one. It smells pretty healthy. It's got some ketoberitine, whatever the fuck. Ketoberitine. I, I don't know. Listen, what are you bothering me for? I got 600 in me and two from the afternoon, two pieces of fucking psilocybin mushrooms, you know. Jesus Christ. We're like hot suckers. We got New Orleans right now. We got, uh, they're playing, I forget who, Carolina. Carolina. And then at 8 15 tonight, we got ourselves a fucking old school rivalry. The Cleveland Browns with Deshaun Watson and a bunch of masseuses showing up to <laughs> Pittsburgh. <laughs> showing up to Pittsburgh up there. To fucking, who the fuck knows, man? Oh. I'm just happy to see you. I had a great weekend. My brother Mike came up from Delaware. 
Oh, he did? Uh, my brother Mike Runny. Yeah, I remember. Up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we came up from Delaware. We hung out Saturday night. We uh went and got a great fucking steak. And then we went up to the Meadowlands, to the racetrack. Do they and, have races? Uh, no, I go up there to see a fucking play by Liz, Liza Minnelli. Yeah, they got races, cocksucker. I don't know. They can't. They close a lot of those things. I'm going to be as honest as I can with you. I didn't even know the racetrack was behind me until I was getting ready to leave. Because what we were, were at, we were into the FanDuel Center because my friend was playing on the third floor, his band, the Past Masters, Steve oh, okay. Abola, kid yeah. I grew up with since day one. Great band. The guy from the Good Rats was there. They did take it to Detroit. Fucking great. It was just, it was on a rooftop. I didn't drink any alcohol. I smoked like 15 joints and I went up there. I ate a couple mushrooms and I listened to them. I saw a bunch of kids from high school, a bunch of girls from high school. It was great to see them. I'm and surprised we you even went down there. there. <clears throat> What's that? I'm surprised you even went down there. Trust me, me too. But I had to get out of the house. I had to go see my man of Villo. It's been too long, you know. And it was a perfect night. You know, it was perfect. It was it, it's September in New York City, brother. San Gennaro fee started last Thursday, and I still haven't gone over there because I want to go in the daytime. But the nights this week are gonna be so fucking beautiful. Like it rained here all day, but tonight's fucking beautiful. Is is it your favorite time in the in New York in the fall? Yes, it is. Yes. Yes. What now, about in the? Because I love I love everything about New York, but like, why is the fall your favorite? Because it's just something in the air. The Yankees are in the playoffs. No, not this year. <laughs> well, <laughs> some that's why when nine eleven happened, it hit me so hard because I knew that's the time of the year it'll be in New York City. Now their little fucking fiesta was torn down by. So I always think of that. Like I love this time of the year in New York City. It's fucking beautiful. It really is beautiful. It's it's a it's nice not too hot. You know what I'm saying? When you get mugged now, you don't feel so bad. <laughs> when you get hit on the street by some guy who hates Asians, you don't feel Ooh. so bad. I got hit on 52nd Street. It was a beautiful day. The sun was out. I landed Have in a you... puddle full of piss instead of fucking acid. You know, whatever. Oh, thank God. Have you gotten mugged in New York? When I was a kid, they tried really? to mug. In the Bronx, yeah, I got chased. I went to a, I went to a play, uh, a fucking toy store in the Bronx. My mother's dry cleaner was around the corner, and you knew in those days you had to be careful up in the Bronx. So I had the twenty dollar bill in my sneaker. It smelled like fucking gorilla glue and fucking God knows what else. <clears throat> and when I went to get at the toy store, when he gave me the change, the kids saw me. And sure enough, I walk out of there and fucking I got three little fucking kids walking behind me. And then I just started running on Tremont Avenue. When I ran, I made it to the dry cleaner before they could get their filthy little hands on me. And then maybe a year later, I tried they tried to mug me in Central Park for my lunchbox. I remember you know, that one. Out. Yeah. Damn, and then, but pretty much when you're walking around, like I, I was training, I was trained to walk up there in the 70s. And 80s. It was, listen, I could tell you a bunch of lies. It was what it was. <laughs> how you present yourself on stage, how you stand up, that confidence. It's the same thing when you're walking those streets. <clears throat> so it's just something that you learn. You know, we were talking about last week about how I don't touch the microphone and people mm -hmm. lose their mind. You know, once I found that, but it took years for me to get there. I just didn't pop up on stage and go, I'm not going to touch the microphone. It took years of trial and error. And that trial and error, how to touch the mic, how to hold you. You ever see an open mic when he pops his elbow up and you know he's green? On the I mic stand? Tell, I could tell what you're doing by the way you hold the mic. <clears throat> I you, And you've always told me that, and I've always followed your thing. I I'm, I know you're gonna give me shit for this. Have you ever have you watched any of Mrs. Maisel on Amazon? No. And I'm sure you hate it. The one thing that and because I actually like the show, the one thing that upset she always leaves the mic stand in, in front of her, which is like I don't take the mic out, but that's the one thing like 
everyone taught me is like, if you're going to take the mic out, you got to move the mic stand. And she always leaves it in front of her. It bugs the shit out of me. You don't like that show? Everybody has their own thing. And when you pull her aside and you ask her one night, like when you're having coffee, Miss Maisel, why do you leave the fucking <laughs> microphone there? She'll tell you. She'll tell you something that in her mind, she thinks she's fat and she fucking wants to hide behind the mic. I mean, we all have the craziest fucking reasons, Lee. You know, everybody has a fucking different reason on why they do things. Lee, what works for me might not work for you. And what works for you might not work for me. I was talking to Lenny Clark the other day, great Boston comic. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> he was in uh, one of Rodney's specials with Bill Hicks and Dice. Fucking, he was there. You know, he was fucking there. And we were talking about something. And I go, I don't know how you're feeling today, but I want you to know something. That for a year, I tried to be you. I went out and I put, I bought so many suits on a credit card. Like I had a, a credit card from my divorce. Right. And I would go to whatever it was called. I forget the store. The guy's name was Bob Schultz. And I would get a suit from him every week. And it would always have to have a label inside. Even if this, I would get like a label to put in there. Because Lenny Clark, when he did the set that night, his jacket opened and he had a label in there. I loved that look on stage. I tried it for a year. And then I had to finally fucking give back the suits. Because it wasn't working for me. But I didn't know until I tried. Was it did, was it that you didn't feel comfortable? Do you think the audience didn't like not that the they didn't believe that you'd wear a suit? It. Audience yeah. wasn't buying it. You can't put a silk hat on a pig. The audience was not fucking buying it. And I'm okay with that. They want me to be a hooded sweatshirt, sneakers, Adidas, jeans. That all came to play later on. I used to wear work boots on stage. That don't work. I'm not a construction fucking worker. How do I find this out? By trying. Trying. I I love, I'm very lucky to get to go and do some shows with Josh Wolf every once in a while. And he told me, that he would do like experiments for a year. Like for a year, he sat down on stage. For a year, he walked around. For a year, he left it in the stand. And like, it, it like, so it's to me, it's so scary to test things out like that because I feel like every time I do a set anywhere, I'm auditioning, like, I'm audition, like trying to prove that I belong there. <clears throat> well, that's so the other like, thing. I was thinking about that and I'm sorry to interrupt you, but. Let's say you're a feature act. Let's say you're an MC and you go to, let's just make up a club, Joey's Steakhouse. And then you go to first year as an MC. Then the second year, he really likes you and he puts you as a feature. And then he puts you in there again as a feature. Now you're in there one MC and two feature times. He pretty much likes you. You know what? On a Thursday night and on a Wednesday night, I don't know why you're not experimenting. On a Sunday wow. night, I don't know why you're not experimenting. They already like you. You're not going to lose your... I get the first two times you perform there, you want to be like, listen, nobody wants to eat a bag of shit. But you got <laughs> you, you to gotta try your new stuff. And you have to... I really like... Like, listen, man, I love stand-up. And I love being impressed by stand-up. I love watching a stand-up and going, fuck, fuck. And saying, I can never do that today. Right. I can't do that today. Tomorrow, maybe in a year. So I always like to keep it fresh. You know me. You've worked with me for years. You know that I like to even move my material from set to set. Even if it's just a material change. Because that will oh, throw them off. How many fucking people come to the early show and the late show? How many fucking times right we show in Chicago and then the dumb agent would book me like in Toledo, Ohio, and it's the same fucking audience four hours away. Now they're telling me, I went to see you in Chicago, and I'm like, God damn it. I got to come up with material out of my ass because I don't give a fuck. I don't give a fuck if it's one day or six months ago. If you see me within a year, I should have new material. Well, when I come to your town once a year, every 18 months, Right. I should have a new 45 minutes. There, there should not be a joke heard. There should not be so many fucking things. 
But the the and crazy like, thing with you, go ahead, bro. Was even be- way before I started stand up when like back with either you or the priest. The first thing that we did, the first CD that we did. Everyone else, when they're recording a CD or a special, does. They might move around the order a little bit. They might change a word here or there. You never did the same joke the same way. Mm. Now, like, it, it blew my mind. And it would annoy me because I was trying to edit it between it. But, like, you, I don't even know. I To this day, I don't know how you did that. Well, it was 20 years, Lee. It's 20 years. At the end of 20 years, if you don't have a complete grasp on this art, you didn't work this fucking art. Okay, we don't have a complete grasp on it. Somebody told me that's great that you're doing comedy 10 years. Come see when, me when you're doing comedy 20 years. And I got to be honest with you, they were right. I saw a lot of a lot of improvement, a lot of confidence, a lot of Remember I told you that towards the before the pandemic, that last year before the pandemic, I was learning things. I was going on stage and doing something and going, where the fuck did I get that from? Not to you or anybody else, to myself. And for some reason, my mind would take me to a specific night where I was in Montana or Salt Lake City doing a triple run or doing some club. Who the fuck knows? But I would say, wow, thank God I did that that night because I would have never done it. Like, it's just crazy. You just improve, but you got to give it a fucking chance. And now with Instagram and Twitter and all this shit, it makes the comedian take 50% of his time to work on that. When he should just be focused on the stand-up part of it for the first five or four years. I would. I would because I know I'm just pissing somebody off on Instagram with my stupid fucking jokes. Right. And and you know what? That was there's been a lot of talk. And I'd love and it doesn't even matter about the specific comic, but there's been a lot of talk about how much of your act is coming from truth and how much of it is made up. <clears throat> Do you have any opinion on being able to, you know, not fabricate, but make things funny and and, and change what happened and Let me give you a story here that I always thought about. I was very scared of always doing this joke. I was petrified of doing this joke, Lee. And when I would do it, I would go, fuck, I'm done after tonight. I'm going to wake up on Monday and there's going to be a notice at my door. There's going to be three police officers with an animal control animal, you know, because people will just believe anything. I had a joke that I did coke with my cat. Okay, yeah. Okay. The story of the matter was, let's get down to basics. One night I came home fucked up on coke while I was getting coked up there. And the cat came over to me. And in my, anybody who's done cocaine, you're lonely. So I kind of started talking to the cat, you know, like, what do you think? And I caught myself and I'm going, am I fucking retarded? (laughs) We had a whole conversation like, I thought that he was talking back to me. Like, not like with his words, like, hey, you're a fucking idiot, but <laughs> telepathically. Just, again, in my cocaine-derived mind in nine, in 2001 or 2002. <clears throat> and one night, I was really fucked up, and he came out to sit with me. He wouldn't sit with me. He'd sit right here by the computer, and I'd be on the computer making believe I wasn't coked out. But I really was. Just right. so the fucking guy in the circle there that's watching me wouldn't see me doing coke. I would hide from the little circle. <laughs> the camera. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I gave him one night I took a coke rock and he sniffed it. Like his nose, the coke rock wouldn't have fit in his fucking nose. So I put it in the middle and he just like sniffed it and he went away. That was it. That's the true story what did i turn it into yeah i love he that joke. Me for two weeks i gave him a line so i turned the three minute story into a 25 minute story it was 80 percent fabricated but that's what made it funny 
Everybody knew I wasn't doing cat with my coke with my cat, but I knew eventually there'd be some motherfucker that would go, dog. Yeah. I would, that was the most uncomfortable position I've ever been in. And I would talk about getting paranoid with him, that we look out windows together. It's something that happened, and I took it to the next level of fabrication. But everybody knew, you know what I'm saying? When I told the hooker story, <laughs> when I told the hooker story, that was a real story. The fabrications were exaggerations of what we were doing. Like when we had a fist fight in the car and we threw punches at each other for 10 minutes. That, that's a lie. That's a plain out lie. We probably threw two smacks at each other and everybody was yelling and screaming because everybody was nervous. A black chick in a car with a wigs swinging a fucking straight razor. That's never a good fucking look right there. You know what I'm saying? But do you view so, it as a lie? Huh? Like that word. I don't view it as a lie. It's, it's not a speech. It, it It's a we're trying to make people laugh. A lie to me seems like a ne very negative, like we're doing something to, I don't know. I don't view it as a lie. I never told a joke that was completely fabricated. Like I was in the city one day trying to get some weed. And I, you know, I, I was here. I was in New York City. I, I wasn't living here. I was passing through. And mm -hmm. I landed at Port Authority. And I checked my bags at like a, one of those lockers mm -hmm. and I took the A train up to Harlem and I went looking for weed and I couldn't find it. And the next thing you know, I went to get the A train back. And when I went downstairs, I saw a, a crack hole. I was on the phone with Josh Wolf and he'll tell you that the, the girl came up to me and she's like, for $3 and a lighter, I'll suck your dick. And I'm like, Josh, did you hear that? I did a whole bit on that years later. That, you know, and it was basically for $3 in the light, I'll suck your dick. And I go, hold on. And this is the true story. I go, how about a dollar in a book of matches? <laughs> go fuck yourself, you fat, stinky motherfucker. And I'm like, fuck you, bitch. And she walked away and she came back and she goes, okay, $2. <laughs> I mean, it was it was just something that it was. And at the end, that what do you think? I'm going to go into a fucking cave with it or suck my dick? You're crazy for two dollars. Listen, it's like getting a fucking order house steak for two dollars. You're eating somebody's fucking possum. Right. You're not eating <laughs> steak. You know, what's a two dollar blowjob in a train station gonna be like? Your dick's gonna be purple until next fucking uh whatever, Rosh Hashanah. You can't even go to grandma's to eat the fucking <laughs> soup because your dick is purple. You know, it's a two dollar blowjob. I was never gonna go into that. I don't think the joke took me to that she sucked my dick at it like we got into an argument and she had a black eye and da, 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 which she did. And that was the truth. I said, uh, well, you smoke crack. And she goes, no, I fell down or something. I forget what the whole thing was, but that was something that happened that I turned into something else. And you don't, cause I don't feel like, I don't, I don't know. I don't feel like the most, they had a whole article about someone, and I just don't. I don't know. I don't feel like it's a negative thing. I don't feel like we're we're going out there telling our life story like it's. It would be crazy. Like that's. I don't know. I don't. Do you feel like your life is maybe your life is, funnier than most? I just feel like, you know, you 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 take that's what like learning how to make things funny is. So that's why I think storytelling is so hard. I'm, not good at it right now. Right like now. That's, it's right so now, hard. Today. It's so much different. Yeah. Because yeah, you're looking at it different. I did too. I didn't discover storytelling till 1999. I was nine years into comedy. And I moved to LA and the vagina monologues was big. So I wanted to do something to compete with it. And I called it the the testicle testaments. And then years later, you and I revisited them with stories. Uh -huh. that's the, story. The, the testicle testament was uh, a story where you found out you had balls. Not that you fucked a neighbor. Not that you beat up Nikki from the corner. A different situation. But hold on. We'll leave it at that. I got to give a word out to my sponsors this week before the fucking game starts. They get their action in. All right?
Give me two minutes. I'll be right back. And now for a word from my sponsors. What's happening, beautiful people? Uncle Joey here to keep you posted up on DraftKings Sportsbook. The NFL action is in full effect. College football is in full effect. Baseball is in full effect. Soccer, everybody's in full effect. New customers, I'm not going to tell you again. I know you're looking for a home. You bet $5 and get $200 instantly in bonus bets. That's right. $200 instantly in bonus bets. Throw five down on any of the week's epic matchups or walk away an instant winner. The fun doesn't stop there either. All customers can take advantage of two new offers every single game day this September, like I just did with Atlanta. Who do you guys think you're dealing with, Joey Bananas? Football's more fun when you're in on the action, just like anything else. Anybody can watch porn, but if you can jump in, what are you going to do? So download the app now and sign up with code Joey. New customers, bet $5 to get 200 instantly in bonus bets only at DraftKings Sportsbook the official sports betting partner of the NFL, an official sports betting partner of the NFL with Code Joey. In other words, when you're with DraftKings, the crown is yours, and Uncle Joey's with you too. I'm over here throwing heat with DraftKings. So download the app, use Code Joey, and let's start having some goddamn fun. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www1800 Gambler.net. If you're in New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NEW-YORK or text HOPE-NEW-YORK-467-369. We're back, Jack. Anyway, we were talking about fucking uh, telling the story, and that's all stand-up is. Stand-up is whatever you want it to be. It's an art. It could be storytelling. It could be one-liners. Basically, it's how your world collides with the rest of the world. When I told the story about punching a fucking nun in the head, the who would ever think of attacking a fucking nun? That collides with people's inner... That's what you're doing. You're colliding with their inner structure. This motherfucker went out a nun when he was 10 years old. What the fuck? Did, you know, that's what it is. Was the nun story a, a lie? Not at all. Was it exaggerated at parts? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's what makes it funny. Right. And if people don't understand that, who gives a fuck? That's what the problem is with stand-up today. You got too many chiefs and not enough Indians. There's too many people laying claims on people's sets, and they're looking, and who the fuck are you? You right. never even lasted as a fucking stand-up for a year. Let me see your fucking tapes on stand-up. You know, that's why I joined jujitsu. Because I was really pissed off when I would watch UFC or listen to uh, MMA fighting coverage. These people putting these fighters down, but they've never done the training. I'm horrible at jujitsu, horrible. But I go because so I understand what these guys go through. It's always people who want to put this shit down that don't go through that at some level. They don't know what it is to fucking sleep in a bus or, you know, they can't understand. You got in the trailways bus to do a free set two hours away. There's some people that'll never understand that. But they'll dress up like a fucking pygmy and go to a Raider game and then jump up and down like a fucking gugutz. So we all have our different fucking faults, Lee. Oh, absolutely. But that that brings because you you've always for years have equated stand up to like fighting. Like you can see parallels. I was trying to think because we we're, I've been watching a lot of football. We've been talking about football. To me, like I, I always hear, like you know, defense wins championships. You can't do, the, uh, we can't be a good team without defense. What, is there something like that relates that to stand up? Is like, is there one part of stand up that you think is like, if you don't have this, you're not going to be a good stand up? Well, the number one thing about a stand up is insight and in how he looks at things. The difference on how he could thwart the thought, like George Carlin was fucking the king of that. <clears throat> he could look at something, Anthony Jeselnik. You know, there's so many guys that have an eye. Uh, I was watching some Mitch Hedberg about a week ago. Oh, my God. He was talking about something fucking simple. 
and he broke it down to the common denominator. And when I watch Mitch Hedberg, I realize how lazy we've become as stand-up comics. Because Mitch Hedberg, Mitch Hedberg wrote a fucking hell of a joke, bitch. Mitch Hedberg wrote a hell of a fucking joke. <clears throat> and a hell of a bit. And just there was just something about it. I just saw one of his sets on Instagram. Maybe a couple days ago. Two day, I don't know. And it was fucking brilliant. You know, and listen, storytelling, and I'm the first one to tell you this, storytelling, speaking to the audience, and I know some people are going to disagree with me, but it's, you're going away from the stand-up routine. I was raised at the stand-up routine as a set-up punchline, and you can have that in storytelling. How do I know? Because I did it in storytelling. <clears throat> but at first, I just want you to grasp set up punchlines that's the most important thing to grasp and you know let your mind go wherever the fuck it goes you saw duncan on stage with a fucking dope with a, a dummy singing fucking wish you were here you yeah. <clears throat> let it go who gives a fuck what they think it's what you fucking think anyway that's what stand up is is how your world collides with everybody else's fucking world that's why people say to you, I can't believe you're driving four fucking hours to pick up $50. <laughs> they don't see it that way. You do. You see something to it. But then again, you don't see the profit in selling Amway and knocking right. on doors and telling people, hi, I have an iron for sale. That guy probably does that for a living. So never just would stand up. Listen, man, I, I wasn't the best writer in the world. I told you last week, it was all energy with me. I knew how to throw my voice. I knew how to command you with my voice. I knew how to, the word isn't command, it's controlled by different levels of your voice and different pitches, you know? These are things that I had to use. The, you know, some people use steroids, you know? Some people use this, the more sets you do, you found how you find out how you could take advantage of every situation, from the marijuana use. You know, I want you to not smoke dope and go on stage right now. Not you. You could do whatever the fuck you want. But these guys, <laughs> one to three, focus on the stand up. Focus on the stand up, and just write. I want you to, you know, well, Joey. People say that if I do current affairs, current events. The joke only lasts for a week. Yeah, but you don't understand. You're writing. It's an exercise. It's a fucking great exercise. You know, it's funny. The other night when you called me and were talking about me and about your set on Saturday night, I thought about one night when I was at the improv and I was showcasing for APA. Okay. And I was at home all afternoon just writing notes with no shirt on, smoking cigarettes. <laughs> I was fucking just trying to write jokes. And I'm trying to write all these fucking Mitch Hedberg type jokes, which I would never was. But all of a sudden, it's eyewitness news. And you know, in LA, they give you eyewitness news and they go to, in La Hambra, and I swear to God, these are the <laughs> first two stories. In La Hambra, a kid gets stuck in a sewer and they go to La Hambra and the little fat Mexican kid is stuck in the sewer, <laughs> you know, and his parents are begging to come out. He's stuck. All you can see is his little head and the fire department's rubbing butter on him and pulling him out oh. of there. And he's like, ah, ah, ah. And I don't know what happened. And they go, we're going to another story in Hawaiianville, you know, down there uh, where all the, uh, not the Hawaiians are, you know, Tua Tatapupu, the quarterback from the fucking uh, Miami Dolphins. Where's he from? Hawaii. Isn't he from Hawaii? Right. They have a, a, it's where my man, God rest his soul, the quarterback from Colorado. Ocean, Samoa. Oceanside. I'm sorry. No, the guy that died in the in the 90s, that he got the, the coach's daughter pregnant. <clears throat> anyway. I don't know that one. Yeah, you guys don't know Dick. Relax. Fucking, uh, he's from Oceanside. <laughs> so, what are we fucking talking about here? Now the edibles are starting to kick in. It was the second news story. Right, so the second news story would be going live to Oceanside, and they show a Samoan guy and a Samoan girl arguing on the street, and she's holding on to a truck, right? 
Okay. And all of a sudden, you see the little Samoan, because the Samoan chick was bigger than the Samoan guy. This is one of those fucking rare situations. They were dating. And all of a sudden, they show the Samoan guy haul off and punch the Samoan chick in the face. And she basically goes down like a weeble's wobble, bangs her head, and pops back up to her feet. And that instant, the guy got in her truck and started taking off. And you see her chasing him down the street. A sandal had broken off, and she had one sandal on. Her feet were like mine, big, dry, and ugly, with missing toenails and shit. And she's running and chasing the truck. And all of a sudden, you see a dive into the truck, and he speeds up, and she misses. And she oh, just no. concrete, and you see it get like torn up. <laughs> He's like taking off beep beep, talking about Hawaiian music and Don Ho and shit. So I go to this fucking APA thing an hour later, two hours later, and I get up on stage and I thought I had two great jokes. And I threw out my first two jokes, and guess what happened? Dick. That's what happened. Wow. I didn't get even a peep. <clears throat> and something made me stop. And I said, anybody watch the news tonight? Anybody see that fat little kid get stuck in the sewer? And I just went with it. What the fuck was he doing in the sewer? Looking for a fucking burrito, you fat fuck? Get home. Do your homework. I just ran with it. And then I went into the ocean side thing. I didn't even know what I was talking about. But it was a seven-minute showcase. So I killed five minutes with those two jokes. And then I threw my closer in. Voila. Fuck it. <laughs> But the bad news was APA never signed me. You know what I'm saying? So, did they like that like stuff right I, off the cuff though? The audience liked it. The audience. I really did. I, I'll never forget those two because, and after that, I stopped watching the news. But the jokes weren't any good after that. It was just that particular two stories. You know, that's crazy. <clears throat> that's really it's. Uh, you know what, man? I, I really appreciate. I love being your friend, but like. It's one of the most frustrating parts about comedy is I feel like most comics at my level don't have anyone to talk to about this stuff. They don't. So I love just being able to throw this stuff out there. They don't. And I like that you call me after your shows while it's still fresh on your mind. Because it gives me a couple of days to think about an answer for you. But I swear to God, when you were telling me that story, that's all I thought about was fucking uh, the, uh, the, the fat Mexican. Fat little Mexican kid that got stuck in the sewer. Poor bastard. I wonder where they are today. He's probably got a bunch of tattoos in place of where he fucking sewer boy. Oh, he probably does cameos. I was a sewer boy. And... So let's talk about football for this week coming up, my friend. So, but listen, I got it. The only bet I've ever won, I beat you in Kansas City Jaguars. I'm fucking, I'm happy about that one. I but saw that. Congratulations, cocksucker. Thank you. The only one I'm going to have all season. Crazy. Don't get too crazy. Remember, when you go to DraftKings, you got a motherfucking profit boost. Right now, you got the Saints in Carolina at three apiece. The line is still Cleveland two and a half over the Steelers. Who do you like there in the second game? Fuck nut. I'm going to go with Cleveland because I feel like Pittsburgh, and I actually have, do I have Pittsburgh? No, uh, but I, I think Cleveland's going to beat Pittsburgh. I think Cleveland's pretty good. They got that good. They got Nick <coughs> Chubb on defense. Okay, now Thursday night, you got the Giants against the 49ers in San Francisco. Giant San Francisco's given 10 and a half points to the poor Giants. They had a great game in Arizona. What do you like that, Tarzan? I think that yeah. one to me is going to be San. I think San Francisco, I mean, is going to just destroy them. I don't think it's going to be close. But that's see that the the stuff with the points there freaks me out. Like I, I looked at that one, I'm like ten plus a lot of fucking points. I think San Francisco is going to kill him, but you don't make any money betting San, just San Francisco to win. Because San Francisco to win was like minus, you know, twelve hundred or something last time. I don't even know what, but it, like if you bet the Giants getting twenty five dollars, you only win forty seven. So if you bet fucking San Francisco and you bet twenty five on them. You win 47. With this, you win either or. If I take the money line on San Francisco, I win $4.54 if they win. Right. That's nothing. So with football, the thing I like about DraftKings is the more legs you add, the more money you win. So for a guy like me, like last night, I didn't do it yesterday because I was, I did something else yesterday afternoon. 
I would always bet Shaquan to score Saquon. a touchdown. He scored mm-hmm. two yesterday, but I didn't bet on anything. So when I bet the Giants, I would usually bet Shaquan, get a profit boost. That's what I like the most. Tonight you get a 50% profit boost for any Monday night game. So that means if I opt in to the profit boost at DraftKings tonight, and they don't have these all the time, and that's why I tell people you got to get jump on top of these cocksuckers. So before it was now, if I – what the fuck? Where's my draft boost in? But those things, they, they, they got me last night with that. I had Tyreek Hill 75 yards or more, and they gave me like a 100% profit boost, and he had 40 yards. The only good thing the Patriots did last night. Okay, so with the profit boost, I make $48 if I bet Pittsburgh. And with the profit boost, ooh, hold on. This is a good profit boost. I get fifty-seven sixty. So it just went up on a $25 bet. So if I take Cleveland Browns minus two and a half, I get a 50% profit boost, maximum 100% wager. How are you going to act if your fucking rims don't are clean? Anyway, you got the Giants in San Francisco. <clears throat> you also got Buffalo at Washington. And the Buffalo should destroy him again. Plus six and a half. You got Jacksonville playing the Houston Texans in Jacksonville. Yeah, that Which one. Like, there's a lot of like one-sided ones next week, I think. Yeah, you got Miami playing the Broncos in Miami. Their first home game of the season, given six and a half. That'll probably go up to seven. This is a phenomenal game next week. Indianapolis Colts against the Baltimore Ravens in Baltimore. Baltimore given seven and a half. Detroit's playing Atlanta in Detroit, given three and a half. I'm going to go with Detroit on that game. Uh-oh. Now, but, Uh-oh. Can I pause Let's... you for one second? Oh, go yes. ahead. Go ahead. For the Colts and the Baltimore. See, that one I think Baltimore should win, but when I, when I checked before, the over-under was 44. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's going to go – oh, because I look – so this is when I – and I don't know if I'm overthinking it. The Colts have allowed – you're uh, overthinking 31 it. and 20 points. Yeah, you're oh. overthinking it. You no, don't think the, it's gonna be over 44? Don't, don't work for it. Yeah, but let the line it's only Monday. Let the line okay. breathe for a couple of days and let's see where it goes before you start making selections on the over now because that shit could shift three points. Something right. could happen there on the three points. <clears throat> so yeah, listen, man. Ravens could throw up some points. Mm-hmm. And Indianapolis Colts got a new quarterback. This is pointing at an over and under. You're like, well, we have, shouldn't it go over? You never see the bookie with a part time job. Next, New England Patriots <laughs> against the Jets in Horrorland Day. The Jets are, look at this. New England's given three points. We have, because, and I feel so bad for whatever his name is, the new, the Jets quarterback, but we, we just destroy him. I think I think we're gonna win this game, but it's, it's if we if we lose to the Jets, if the Patriots lose to the Jets, Bill Belichick should have to retire. That would be embarrassing. I was watching him last night, and I'm like, with all the great things he's done, it's time for somebody to tap him on the shoulder and say it's time to go. You've won. I don't know how many rings you've done. So many great things. You just you got a team that it's gonna you. You don't have enough time to turn them around. No. Like he's got to get start all fucking new again with these guys. He's too old. He's done what he had to do. He has he has nothing to prove to the people of Boston or New England or anybody. So who gives a fuck? Anyway, you got the Chargers playing the Minnesota Vikings. I don't know. I don't like these two teams. Cleveland Browns are playing the Titans minus four. Let's see what happens tonight. Arizona is playing the Cowboys in Arizona. Arizona's plus 12 points. Kansas City's playing Chicago at home. Kansas City's minus the 13. I like that bet. <clears throat> uh, Pittsburgh is giving one to the Raiders. Ugh. And next Monday night, you got, what is this shit? Two fucking games again? 
these people are getting fucking creepy. Philadelphia against Tampa Bay and the Rams against Cincinnati. That's a great game in Cincinnati. I think my boy is hurt. What's the matter? Joe Lee, Burrow, right? yeah. Huh? Joe, Joe Burrow, Burrow is hurt, yeah. And Major League, I've been doing okay. This is what I like about here, man. Let me see. The Mets and Marlins are tied up. Cincinnati is winning. You know I got them tonight with the profit boost, and I also got Philadelphia over Atlanta and Atlanta. It's the third inning. If you know anything about Atlanta, they come back fucking every game. You bet that money line. Right now, Atlanta's losing by two. If you put a $25, and now they're not taking fucking money line because I decided to hit the fucking board. They think I'm Lee Sayat. Here you go. Boom. So if I take the money line right now for Atlanta, if I bet $25 on the Atlanta Braves right now in the third inning, you get back seventy seven fifty. Are they losing? Yeah. But in the I'm third inning, okay. they're losing to Philadelphia. They got Philly's pitching a great guy tonight. I forget what his fucking name is. It don't matter. And uh, But that's Monday night. I like looking at baseball because <clears throat> everybody's betting football. Listen, right. it, doesn't, it doesn't mean you're a big shot if you know who's going to win New Orleans or Carolina. It doesn't make you a big shot if you know who's going to win uh, – Cleveland, Pittsburgh. You know what makes you a, win, a big shot? That you win money, whether it's $25 or $10. So tonight, all the focus in sports is on Monday Night Football. A guy like you, a slick little hustler, boom! You know what I'm saying? Fucking get a 50% boost on any live MLB bet tonight. What I'm going to do is this. Right now, right in front of you, cocksuckers, I'm going to opt into that, and I'm actually... Ooh, Jesus shot that nut. And I'm actually going to put, <laughs> come on, cocksucker. I'm actually going to put 25 on Atlanta. Bonus available. The bonus is uh, MLB 50% live bonus, maximum $100 wager, 50% profit boost. So now, if I take the small, if I take Atlanta, the money line, they win. I put $25 in to win 111.15. Jesus. You know, guys, That's... this is not to be popular at the bar and tell your friends who won. If you're going to bet, you're doing it to win fucking money, whether it's – and you're trying to double your investment. So if I put 25 down, 47 is not acceptable. It's not acceptable. I got Chinese lunch. I got bitches. I got bills to pay. I got gas for my fucking car. You know. So what's your favorite pick of the week there, Tarzania? If you had a and bet, I, some I think the Chargers stuff. are going to beat Minnesota. I think the Chargers are going to beat Minnesota. I think that I have a couple unders. I think the New England versus the Jets is going to go under 37. That's what I saw it at. Right now, I understand you want to wait on it, but I think that both offenses suck and we have, both have good defenses. And the other one I had was the, the Colts in Baltimore over 44. Yeah, I like that too. I like the Ravens too, kid. Yeah, the Ravens, Lamar, Lamar Jackson's great, and I like the Colts, and I like their new quarterback. But he got, he got, he, they pulled him out of the game last week because he had a concussion. So they might have like their backup in. So I don't know that. Those are my, those are the three. Because I, the other one, and you said it today with Saquon, the the anytime touchdown, Ramondre Stevenson. I don't think he has a touchdown yet this year. If he does, it's not for the Patriots because I think we're gonna. I think the Patriots are going to beat the Jets. If if we don't, it's a, it's an embarrassment. What's with the Wii? You getting out there this week and doing fucking practices with them? Yeah, you know I, I have to listen. They, I I would help them out at this point. That's how bad we've been. What do you got this week? What kind of shows you got? This Thursday, I'll be at the the Loft in Chicopee. It's a good it's the, it's a good Jewish deal. We have for twenty bucks, you get a buffet and a and a comedian. What so kind I'm of there on the. It changes every week. Sometimes it's chicken. Sometimes it's steak. They got veggies. It's not. It's mystery, a. It's a fun deal. Mystery meat. No, no, I, I, I have never knock on wood because I always, I always eat it. I've, I have never gotten sick. It's a, it's. I love going to places where there's not much else to do, which is exactly what Chickpea is, and they're, they're so much fun. 
and then next week I'm Friday and Saturday this week. I don't have anything right now. Friday, Thursday through Saturday next week. I'm in Omaha with Josh Wolf. You know, right now you're doing the best thing you can with stand up comedy. You're living on your rules, on your terms. You've got a day job. You're not worried about fucking headshots like they were in LA already. You're not worried about your resume. You're not where all you're worried about is getting on stage every night. And this is the best time of your life. I think for me, if I have to look back, that was the best time of my life. 91 to 95 fucking getting in a car with four of your friends. And even in Seattle, Seattle was where I really learned the, I was a true open micro up there that became a feature act up there. Not in whatever. When I went up there, I was I was already kind of featuring 25 minutes. Mm-hmm. But going up there, that camaraderie I had with Brody and Josh and Tana Manu and Mitch Hedberg and Stan Hope, it was you I'll never have that. I never had that again. So when you're driving to these gigs and you're thinking, fuck, I can't wait, take your time. Take your time. It- I, I and I I I've heard other people say you've said it before. I have a really and it's not even just stand up in life. I have a hard time being patient, and it's, I'm I'm really trying. I'm really trying to enjoy it. But well, you I see, know me. You think I was patient, my friend? <laughs> no, probably okay. not. I'm telling you, you have uh, no disrespect. You have Jewish neuroticisms whatever those fucking things on the rosis, whatever it is, where you go crazy like Felix Unger. Mm, mm. <laughs> so uh, you don't need it. I mean, with you, I get it. And with me, I, I'm not going to lie to you. It was, we wanted everything to be perfect. Mm-hmm. You know, you want everything to be perfect, but that's why it's stand-up comedy. It's not going to be perfect. A waitress is going to drop a glass. Uh audience member is going to puke. Uh, audience member is going to pass out on edibles. We've seen that a couple oh, of yeah. times in the last 10 years, you and I. We start, you know, you experience a lot of different audiences. Don't ever blame it on the audience. Blame it on yourself. You tried to be, how many nights have you gone there with too much ego? And you know how many nights I would kill on Tampa? I would kill at the Miami Improv for a whole weekend. I was a feature act. People come up to me, light cigarettes at me, give me cocaine. And that Sunday when I landed in Miami, when I landed in L.A., I couldn't wait to go down to the comedy store to talk shit on how I slayed Miami. And and then I'm going to go up there and do a spot and lead. You know that nine out of ten times I would die the slowest death of all fucking time. Did you know that? And that's the God honest fucking truth. I would just die on stage. And would it just deflate you, or what do you think? Like fuck them, or like what would you think? You would go, what the fuck? I just did the same set I did the last five fucking nights, and it killed every night. Now at the comedy store, I died. You know what the answer was? I walked in there with too many big balls. I had to humble myself. So since I didn't humble myself, the comedy humbled me for, for me. And you get that from time to time. You know what that does to you? But all these little things are just all a part of the fucking journey. And you turn into one big scab. I'm just one big scab. Look at my face. I got scabs. got scabs on my elbows, scabs on my knees. I got scabs on my ball sack. But most importantly, I got all the scabs from fucking getting beat up and stand up. And one day your body just becomes a fucking scab. And now they can't do nothing to you. The infection's gone. You're done. Now I got to go move forward. Right or wrong, the infection's gone. I got a thick scab over the cut. You know, that's what we are. As a comic, you're just going to become one large fucking scab of pain, of you're not funny enough, you're not tall enough, you're too old, you're too young, you're not, for reasons, got got nothing to do with your talent. Think about that. You saw it. Got nothing to do with your talent. They'll come to you and go, well, you're not funny because you're fat. We don't think fat people are funny. Okay. And now you got to go home and eat a sandwich and come back even fucking stronger. And light their little mom and pop shop on fire. Yeah, it's, and I appreciate it, and I, 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 I know you're right, but it's you're right. I want everything. Not only do I want to be perfect, but I want. I, I, I just sit sometimes on like the drive home from shows, 
And I just imagine what it's going to be like. And I know this doesn't mean anything, but to have someone booking shows for me, to have like just someone who, who can call me and have like a, a full calendar, like next you're week, I'm here next You're 10 years away. I know that. I am, and that kills me. That it, don't even and I don't, I'm not even talking about headlining. And guess, what? and guess what? When you have that person, you're still going to have to book your own gigs. How's that for but, you? Because they're going to yeah. call you with some crazy offers, and then you got to tame them off the roof and go, whoa, 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 whoa. This is what fucking Lee Syatt is doing. So don't worry about that. Right now, just worry about fucking writing, having a great time, and do something I never did when I walked into a comedy club. What's that? Do something I never did. Walk in, stop at the door. I don't give a fuck if they look at you or not. Look around the room, and this is for you and every other young comic that's getting into comedy, or you're in the three-year mark, or the four-year mark, or even the five- or six-year mark. I'm going to give you the best advice that nobody ever gave me. I just did it myself. And when I found out about this, it changed everything. You're going to walk into a comedy club, close the door like a gentleman, look, some people are going to look at you, you're going to wave, but before you bust that next move, you know how you, you stand there and you look and you go, hey, Timmy, hey, Marty. Hey, Johnny. Hey, Joey. When you see that person before you move, I want you to breathe, take a pause and go, no matter what happens tonight, no matter what happens tonight, it doesn't matter because at the end, they're all going to suck my dick. And that's the attitude. Whether you have a great set, whether you got a standing ovation, whether you bomb, all you know is whatever happens tonight, you'll be here tomorrow night too and the night after that. And no matter what happens, all these motherfuckers that are looking to put you down, oh, he did a stolen joke. You know, there's all, I heard I heard uh, Ryan Philippe do that joke and fucking whatever. After all that bullshit and all the years, you're not an amateur, somebody gave you $5, you can't enter the contest. It's that you're scaring people. When all that shit happens is that you're starting to scare people. You're going outside the normal circle. And that's a complete education that we'll get to another time. But from now on, do what I didn't do. Do what I did years later, and I wish I would have done it from day one. Walk in, breathe, Jim Morrison. Take a look around, say which way the wind blow. With a little girl, with a, no, forget it. Just take a look around and which way the wind blow. Notice whoever you have to meet. Hey, how are you? And right there in your mind, before you, as your body's stepping forward, that motion that we do, right there. No matter what happens tonight, doesn't matter. Because eventually, all these motherfuckers are going to be sucking my dick. <clears throat> I'll see you next week, cocksucker. But we'll talk during the week. I love you, buddy. I love you, buddy. And now for a word from our sponsors. Stay black. Welcome back to church. Get your hydration in check. Just mix one stick of liquid IV with some water and get hydrated two times faster than with water alone. Available in awesome flavors, cherry, concord, grape. My new favorite is the white peach sugar-free. Made with quality ingredients and three times the electrolytes of your leading sports drinks. Adding liquid IV to your routine is going to be a no-brainer now. Listen, real people, real flavor, real hydrating. I've been with these guys drinking that product for close to four years now. I love the strawberry, the dark cherry. They got a new cherry, but this new white peach sugar-free, forget about it. And if you drink cocktails, that's even better. Put some rum in this thing here. You'll be floating and stuff. But anyway, grab your liquid IV in bulk at Nationwide at Costco. But I'm going to get you 20% off when you go to liquidiv.com. Did you hear what I just said? 20% off when you go to liquidiv.com. Use code Joey at checkout. That's 20% off anything when you shop for better hydration using promo code Joey at liquidiv.com. Take a chance. Columbus did. It's tremendous. The check-in is also brought to you by Manscaped. Listen, if you're going to, for the clean-shaven look but hate the mess and hassle 
of a wet shave. Listen up, guys. The Handyman, Manscaped's new electric face shaver, lets you shave up to three days of growth. No water or shaving cream required. Who's better than Manscaped? Nobody. They got the same solution for your balls and your asshole. You put that fucking Manscaped on your nutsack and your tip top magoo with both the long hair leveler and full shaver blades. No matter what you look want to look like, the handyman is here to help you. And if you're short on time, the five-minute quick change feature is a lifesaver with the rechargeable battery that offers 60 minutes. That's right. 60 minutes of runtime with Manscaped Skin Safe technology to help reduce nicks and cuts. You'll feel more confident whether you shave your face, your butthole, your ears, or your nutsack. Listen, I'm an old man. I still do my fucking Manscaped up. In fact, I got the extra blade because those white hairs are tough to cut. They're like Paul Bunyan's mother's tree. You know what I'm saying? So if you're a guy in the go, never leave the handyman at home. Perfect for travel. It's compact and airplane friendly. You ready for this? They're going nuts over that Manscaped. They're going to give you 20% off. That's right, 20% off. It's the Rosh Hashanah special. Free shipping with code Joey. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Use code Joey.